1957, the geopolitical landscape changed forever when the Soviet Union launched Sputnik 1. By today's standard, this primitive orbiting satellite is certainly nothing exciting, but in 1957, its impact was psychologically devastating. The launch of Sputnik made outer space the new high ground of the Cold War. The value of space exploration was now obvious. The space race was on. For more than 10 years, the space race thrilled and inspired people all around the world with new and more spectacular accomplishments. Then, on July 20th, 1969, the whole world stopped to watch as the United States, with the crew of Apollo 11, left the first human footprints on the moon. The eagle had landed, and in one sense, the space race was over. Without the competition and fear generated by the Cold War, our reasons to explore space have changed, and our sense of purpose is much less clear. But the truth is, humans use space more now than ever before. Today, many benefits of space exploration, such as weather, communication, and navigation satellites, are routinely taken for granted. Spectacular feats go unnoticed, and the valuable products of orbital research are rarely associated with their origins. Down-to-earth applications of space exploration save people in distress at sea, assess the condition of crops, guide us to remote locations around the globe, and allow us to communicate with each other over vast distances. Unfortunately, without a threat to spur us on, our sense of urgency to explore space has significantly diminished. But the future of space exploration still keeps us looking up, and the value and potential of our work in space is far greater today than ever before imagined. We need only consider the possibilities. I'm Joanne Irene Gabrinowitz, and I'm a professor of space studies here at the University of North Dakota. And tonight we are here to discuss what the possibilities of space are. Joining me here tonight in Clifford Hall Auditorium are a number of North Dakotans, and three North Dakotans in particular, who have chosen to share their views with us on this subject tonight. To my left is Lonnie Filati, a farmer from Maddock and president of Agra Images. Dr. Linda Gourneau, a physician from Newtown, and Rick Hebe, former astronaut and native of Jamestown. Six North Dakota towns, Grand Forks, Hazen, Jamestown, Minot, Mott, and Newtown will all be participating in this community conversation. Tonight's topics are going to be the economic, cultural, and scientific value of space exploration. Space has always been very interesting to me. And uh, ever since I first saw the first moonwalk, uh, I've always wanted to be an astronaut like Rick, but I guess I never will be. Uh, but the next closest thing is to be able to see things from space. Uh, we developed uh, a new company called Agra Images that is taking the uh, satellite technology and bringing it into agriculture in a form that is usable for the average farmer. We're able to analyze the patterns within a field and be able to take them and put them into a variable rate application uh, spreader and analyze the vegetation and change the fertilizer on the go. We were able to revolutionize agriculture in a form that we never knew would ever happen. We're all part of this life and we're also related to all men, all mankind and womankind on the earth. And in a way it's like, yeah, I. I I could understand that, you know, that we're related, and sometimes some people don't see that, but I think once you get up into space and you look back down onto the earth, you realize that you will belong, that's home, and all the people there is family. Tonight we're going to talk mostly about the third of my space shuttle flights. In a lot of ways, it's the least, uh, it was certainly the least glamorous space shuttle mission that I was part of because it was a space lab mission. Although my other missions were certainly visually more exciting, I can pretty well guarantee that when you or I on down the road 10 years from now, 15 years from now, the things that will affect your life in ways that you don't even know about, most of those discoveries will have been made in laboratories like this. Just as an example, one of the 80 experiments we flew, we had a, a furnace in which we had a bunch of different samples that could be injected into the furnace 
held in place with magnetic fields so they wouldn't go floating off and get, get about. And then another uh, magnetic field or electric field was applied to melt those samples. Well, the big deal about that was that this particular metal, they believed that if they can get this special structure, would be slipperier than Teflon and yet a metal. Well, I think anybody in here can immediately draw some rapid conclusions. If you could produce this commercially, every motor in the, in the world within a decade would have to take this stuff into account. Well, now we'd like to invite all of you in all of the towns all over North Dakota to participate in this and um, use our comments as a springboard. I'm uh, Solomon Mandel, a farmer 40 miles from Grand Forks, and I just want to thank all the explorers for everything that they've done for our farming. We run center pivot irrigation. The resolver that tells me what degree my irrigator is is a direct uh, descendant from NASA. The computer that feeds my chickens, that uh, instead of <laughs> running 108 motors, you run uh, 10 motors, uh, 10 minutes at a time, you're still feeding the 60,000 chickens without causing a brownout in Grand Forks. <laughs> the energy savings that we've seen already, the water savings that we've seen with irrigation, we've cut our water use in half. By um, this imaging, we'll, I can see where we'd be able to cut it another 70 to 80 percent in the next four or five years. It's, uh, the technology is there already. Uh, engineer came up to vis visit his brother-in-law in Nebraska in the summer, and his brother-in-law said, let's go out to the cornfield and check the irrigators. They went out and he said, uh, my mechanical water meters broke down. And the engineer said, that's nothing. Everything we do at NASA, we check the flow. He said, I'll send you one of them. It's just a, it's a magnetic thing that runs, and there's no, there are no moving parts. And today, all our water meters are a direct descendant from NASA. And the potential is so great, it's just incredible. At this time in southwest North Dakota, there's an emerging strategy for small town economic development that involves identifying relocatable companies, buying them, moving their operations to small towns in North Dakota. And uh, in this area, uh, our preference would be to buy a small high-tech space-related type company. For how much? Uh, or a manufacturing <laughs> company. No commercials. Uh, can, can UND Space or NASA help in the, the following area? Identify companies for sale that can be relocated. Provide technical expertise to assist relocating. Uh, help evaluate a, a relocation candidates' uh, products or services. And as an alternative, can you suggest ideas for startups uh, derived from some spin-offs in the aerospace industry? Really, NASA probably can't do that for you because it, from an economic point of view, there's no way you could argue that that's part of NASA's charter, but it seems to be clearly part of, of uh, you know, what your state delegation, your, your congressional bodies, that is part of what they should be doing, I think. I've always lived in Maddox, North Dakota, a small town of 600 people, and uh, when I relocated re the company there, they asked me, local people, why do you want to be here in Maddox? And I said, why not? I said, we're, we're connected everywhere. I can hook onto the internet and, and be anywhere in the world. Probably the most dramatic thing that space technology is doing right now is enabling people to engage in commercial activities that, at least for the last few hundred years, have primarily been aggregated in large urban areas. I mean, you can operate a business out of your home no matter where it is now. You have modem, fax, communications, uh, pagers. Uh, what, whatever you need. Dr. Gourneau, how do you think we might encourage uh, not only cultural diversity but discussion of cultural questions, as you alluded to, um, to be a part of future space exploration and uh, the space program in general? And what is the value of including such questions and diversity? I don't know. I've, I've heard somewhere before that for every action there's a reaction. And <laughs> And that, that's going to happen with whatever they're doing in space. And I think it's so important to consider all the cultures of the world because we're all in this together. But I think everyone should be allowed to have a voice to contribute to what's happening to them because it's their future and their children's future. I feel that to some extent the planetary research programs of NASA have been sacrificed uh, to keep the space station afloat. And uh, it strikes me that the planetary probes were very cost effective. As you know, the voyagers were reprogrammed to do things for which they were not really designed to do. 
and it, it bothers me that that money is being uh, sucked up by the space station for a number of reasons. And first, let me state, I would like to see man on the moon and go to Mars. My wife and I would be the first two to volunteer. I've taped most of Rick's missions, and I very much see man going into space. I'm just not cons think that the space station is really the way to do it. Certainly, I agree that the space station has an enormous amount of politics involved. Uh, but then again, based on uh, my observation of the political system is that canceling space station wouldn't, would not of itself guarantee you the planetary probes. That money would not be dedicated. We would, Congress would not say, we're going to take out this $2 billion a year or whatever, and we're going to spend that $2 billion on the space program. They'd take the $2 billion away and probably wouldn't put anything in its place. Linda, do you have any <coughs> final comments you'd like to share? Yes, um, I'd like to say, consider this. A lot of my um, relatives, I guess culturally Native Americans, a lot of our legends have star stories or stories about the space. There's also some tribes down in the Southwest who have these cave drawings. They were aware of all the interplanetary happenings in space long time ago, way before we were even aware at this point now. And there's even um, stories about different worlds. Uh, like I said before, I never was an ast never was going to be able to be an astronaut like Rick. Uh, but boy, I can see a lot of things just as he did in, in a little different perspective. But I feel like I'm up there right now, so go with your dreams and let's uh, move this technology to the next level. I'd like to invite you all to join us here again tomorrow night when we continue this community conversation about what is the value of space exploration. to the second half of a symposium titled, What is the Value of Space Exploration, a Prairie Symposium. We're glad to have you with us tonight and hope that we're going to have as much fun and as much information as we did last night. Joining me here in Clifford Hall Auditorium this evening <clears throat> are part of local North Dakotan communities. And along with us will be Tim Fote, editor and reporter of the Grand Forks Herald, Vivian Myers, a teacher from Bismarck, North Dakota, and Father William Sherman, a sociologist and pastor of St. Michael's Catholic Church here in Grand Forks. Tonight's topics will be the political value of space exploration, the educational value of space exploration, and the sociological value of space exploration. The question at hand is, what is the political value of space exploration? And I must confess that, that I'm going to throw a lot of cold water on, on, uh, on things tonight. Um, I think the evidence at hand suggests that there isn't much political value to space exploration. But that's not to suggest that there couldn't be. Um, and I think that, that what I'd like to do is take a couple minutes to, to uh, uh, think about the circumstances under which there, there could be. One thing that might happen is that there might be a resurgence of economic nationalism. Another set of circumstances uh, might be um, a resurgence of redistributive economics. Um, space might be considered a, a, a sort of grand public work um, that would employ people. And uh, finally, grimly, um, there might be a, um, a resurgence of, of uh, political interest in space as a result of military threats. But I don't think that, that uh, over the long run, those of us who believe that space is a noble thing um, and that we ought to be um, um, going further and, and we ought to be going, um, period. I don't think that in the long run we're going to be satisfied with these circumstances. Space education and exploration is a perfect avenue for the students of, of the 90s. For they have before them a world of unknowns. There, there are in unpredictable hazards and occupations yet to be discovered. These kids have to be equipped with higher level thinking skills, more so than ever before. Space exploration is a unique opportunity for this avenue of learning. Think for a minute, students trying to project into the future. 
trying to visualize what it would be like to live in space, to create a space camp, or to solve problems of garbage in space. These are the kinds of questions that we go through when we go through units of space exploration. Kids are turned on about, about these ideas, and they are futuristic in their thinking. Maybe that's what space can do, is remind us, as people who sort of fall into easy habits, that God is beyond us. God is uh, the God of the universe. We see the pictures of the earth floating around as sort of a little part of a vast universe. Maybe that's why the good Lord, looking at it from a perspective of faith, brought uh, aerospace into our world to remind us of that other dimension of God. God isn't something to be discarded, and to be set aside, and to be ignored, the power and the majesty of it all. And some of you remember that in the Holy Scripture it says something like this, the fear of God, the awesomeness of God. The awe before the presence of God is the beginning of wisdom. If you were the director of NASA, what would your priorities in future for NASA, what would that be? I'd say that, that the strategy ought to be survival. Um, I think that the tactics ought to be to um, uh, get rid of as many missions um, that involve um, exploitation, uh, consolidation, and, and filling in what's left behind, and try to find um, a, a single mission um, that, that um, um, could have a fairly broad um, constituency economically and that could, could uh, uh, be as inspiring as possible. I think I'd do a public relations job. I don't know how it is. Maybe enlist the uh, Hollywood and get them on their side. They seem to have a spokesman for everything out there. And uh, just dramatize it. I think they do a, a, a good job, maybe even a great job, but one of the things that I would change would be to get to advertise themselves more and maybe what the father here was talking about to enlist Hollywood isn't such a bad idea. It seems as though uh, whatever the media presses, we get. Question for the entire panel. I'd like to ask them their opinion about the uh, potential for access to space by ordinary citizens and depending on what your opinion is, how does that how does that reflect on the value of space exploration as perceived by the general populace? It just seems that, it, that, that the cost would be uh, so great that it's hard to imagine that in my lifetime, um, uh, people of my generation will get to fly in great numbers. So I think that you'd, you'd have to look elsewhere to find the value in space exploration other than you know, you just, just, you're not going to get it from um, the kick of flying. Well, somehow, if we could capture the imagination of the nation with uh, spectacular things, maybe what was, Tim was talking about, a fix on something that has all sorts of ramifications, and we'll go along and we'll support it. I have a question for Vivian. Uh, should there be a teacher in space, especially after the uh, Challenger problem and uh, Krista was on board? Yes, I do. I think that if there is someone that wants is willing, is prepared, as much as anyone else out there that would have to go through, you know, all the preparation that it would take. Um, if if they feel that that they would like to, and that it would be advantageous to both sectors of society, I think that that they should. Tim, do you think the news media has a responsibility associated with selling space to the masses? Yeah, I think a lot more, a lot more newspapers and, and journalists. Um, ought to be eager about space, and there ought to be more information about space. Um, but I'm not sure that, that I'd, I'd assign the press a responsibility. Will our concept of God change at all when we get in outer space and we're not, you know, we're not down here on Mother Earth anymore? And we look, you know, when we, we look to the to the to the universe, uh, is, is our, our idea of God going to be any different? You can't look at those uh, those pictures of the Earth and uh, see this whole thing as a, as a bunch of fragmented human beings. You know, the whole business of race and of, of national conflict and so on becomes so petty when we see uh, what a one world it is. That's one aspect. It tells us something about man and women. But the other, I'm convinced, is that uh, 
And it tells us something about the divine. My experience with this has been um, an affirmation of why I have become a space professional. I think my gut, my instinct, my intuition tells me that the value of space and space exploration is its ability to connect and its ability to bring us together. And there is nothing, I think, more dramatic than the last two nights that proves that. Here we are, spread around an entire state, and it's space technology that has uh, brought us together over time and distance. This is two time zones and an entire state, and yet it's one experience. And I want to thank you all, and I hope we get to do it again. So thank you, and good night.